So the puzzle that's posed, the puzzle that strikes me, having heard Andrew and, and realizing that the planet is three quarters water and that we've only explored this tiny proportion of it, the, the, the puzzle is how come so little effort and so little money is actually going into the study of the oceans. So our next speaker, Edith Witter, is preoccupied with this and has actually come up with a variety of measures and tests to uh, help understand the health of the oceans and also a number of technologies to help see what's down there in the deep. Thank you, Edith. So thank you, Moses. It's a great pleasure to be here. I wanted to start out today with a little informal survey. We won't use our clickers here. I just want a show of hands. It's your first day at Idea City, and there's a scientist in the lobby describing environmental degradation. Show of hands. Your response is to, one, move in closer and take notes. One, two, three, four, a few. Two, ask for more details. Three, attempt to remove your ears with a cheese grater. <laughs> Predicting environmental degradation is a thankless task. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to invite the doomsayer to a cocktail party. It's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. But scientists have a special obligation to talk about it because they frequently have first-hand understanding of the issues. And they have to find some way to share that. I've spent my career as a scientist, as a deep sea biologist, studying the animals in the ocean that make light, bioluminescence. My research had nothing to do with environmental degradation. But in 2003, a report came out called the Pew Oceans Commission, followed in 2004 by the US Commission on Ocean Policy Report. And these reports constituted a consensus that the oceans are in trouble and that we needed to act immediately in order to preserve and protect them. As it happened that same year, I discovered a deep sea squid that had never been seen before. It was uh, six feet long. And to imagine that there was something that big in the ocean that nobody had ever seen before, and yet we're destroying the ocean before we even know what's in it. So I took this call to action very seriously and was moved to start the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, a not-for-profit that is focused on developing technological solutions to ocean conservation challenges. Now, while we've been developing on the technology that allows us to see things that other people don't usually get to see, I've also been thinking more and more about these big picture issues. And since I am a child of the age of Aquarius, uh, where I grew up with the model of think globally and act locally, I want to share with you today a little of my global thinking on these issues, what I think are the top 10 problems we're facing, and what we're trying to do locally to address it. So 21st century challenges, increasing population we just heard about. When I was born, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. As we just heard, we've just exceeded 7 billion people. All of those people are consuming resources, producing waste, and generating, uh, using fossil fuels. As a consequence, we have an uh, increase in greenhouse glass, gases and um, global warming. While my, uh, the increase, or the, the uh, early thaw in the spring and the, and the uh, late freeze in the fall may be um, okay with my cousins in Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, it's not so great if you're a farmer. My grandfather, our grandfather, was a uh, a pioneer in Saskatchewan. He broke virgin soil with a horse and plow. And farmers know that you need to have stable climate in order to be able to produce food. And one of the things that we've got to worry about is if global climate change continues at the rate it is, we have to worry about the thermohaline circulation planet, uh, patterns of the ocean actually breaking down and are losing our climatic stability. It's going to make it very hard to feed a hungry planet. We are also just inexorably destroying our life support systems. Ocean acidification, the fact that we could actually be changing the chemistry of our vast blue oceans is almost incomprehensible. 
And um, Andrew just spoke about the importance of our coastal zone environments, the most productive regions, but we're, we're polluting them with nutrients and turning them into dead zones. Air pollution, that, that's a picture from London, but I was out in China last year, and for the two weeks we were there, I think we saw the sun briefly twice, and the rest of the time it was just blocked out by air pollution. And then just a, a alphabet soup of chemicals that we're adding to our water and adding to our soil and creating an alphabet soup of diseases. So the consequence is, you know, we're losing habitat at an alarming rate. In the Arctic, the loss of ice is already impacting polar bears and indigenous people. Uh, we've heard um, from um, Rex uh, on uh, the first day about the loss of coral reefs and the loss of uh, rainforests. And the, what's being done to the bottom of the ocean is criminal, and I've seen it. For one haul of shrimp, you'll have a net that goes across the bottom of the ocean with rollers or chains in front of it that makes the, the bottom fish and the shrimp jump up into the net. And you take a beautiful garden full of corals, deep sea corals and um, sponges, and you turn it into a moonscape for one haul. It's completely unsustainable, and that patch will never produce life again in our lifetimes. As a consequence, we're in the middle of the sixth uh, planetary extinction and, but it seems to be occurring at a faster rate than any previous planetary extinction. And Takea Blaney on um, the first day talked about the vital importance of water and because of climate change, because of pollution, because of mismanagement, wars will be fought in the 21st century over water the way they were fought over oil. Those are the, the, the big challenges we're facing, just some of them actually, but, but the even bigger one to me is that we are leaving the next generation with these ecosystems spiraling out of control and not giving them the tools that they're going to need to deal with this catastrophe. So, ironically enough, one of the biggest things we need to be giving them, and this harkens back to the first day, is optimism. It's been said that Martin Luther King did not ignite the civil rights movement by preaching, I have a nightmare. But all too often in the environmental community, that's what we end up almost having to do in order to get the message across. Now, I should point out that I am not an optimist by birth, I am an optimist by marriage. <laughs> and to let you know what kind of optimist my husband is, uh, I want to share with you my favorite joke because it reminds me of him. There are these twin boys, Ollie and Petey and they're very different, and their mom begins to get worried about them because they're so different. One's a total optimist and one's a total pessimist. So she takes them to a psychologist, he interviews them, and he says, yeah, you got a problem, but I think we can help you out here. So they take Petey the pessimist and they put him in this room full of beautiful toys, and they just leave him there. And then they take Ollie the optimist and they put him in this room with nothing but a big pile of manure. They come back an hour later, and they open the door on Petey the pessimist, and there he is just crying his eyes out. And his mother says, Petey, what's the matter? He says, I just know with all these toys, if I play with them, I'm going to break one. Well, that didn't work very well. So then they go in on Ollie the optimist, and there he is, top of the heap, big grin on his face, flinging the stuff around. His mother says, what are you doing? He says, I just know with all this doo-doo, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> so... That's my husband. And I used to think he didn't have a very firm grip on reality. <laughs> Until I started to notice how many times he would emerge from a steaming pile of excrement leading a pony. <laughs> it is only the optimists that see the solutions. Now, he had kind of an interesting form of optimism that had a duality to it, because he was always also one of the most prepared people I've ever known. And I never was able to quite articulate it, and then I read about it as the Stockdale Paradox in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. And it's named after uh, Admiral James Stockdale, who was the highest ranking officer in the um, prisoner of war camp in Vietnam known as the Hanoi Hilton. And he was there an incredible eight years, tortured 20 times. And he was credited with keeping the morale of the troops up. He developed a communication system for the guys so that they could talk to each other. He took tremendous risks. And 
Collins you know, asked him, how did you survive this living hell? And Stockdale said, I always knew I would prevail. I could always see in the end that I would be home with my family and this would be a defining moment of my life, but I would survive. And then Collins was interviewing him some more and he, he said, well, what about the guys that didn't make it? And Stockdale said, oh, that's easy. They were the optimists. And Stockdale was confused given what, I mean, uh, Collins was confused given what Stockdale had just said. And he said, they were the guys that said, we're going to get out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and go, and they'd say, well, we're going to get out by Easter. And then Easter would come and go, and they'd say, well, we're going to get out by Thanksgiving. And then Thanksgiving would come and go, and Christmas would roll around again, and they'd die of a broken heart. So the Stockdale paradox is the ability to retain faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, while at the same time confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Now, obviously, optimism in and of itself is not a strategy. We also have to be giving these young people the tools that they will actually need to implement that optimism. And for that, uh, as a scientist, I know I'm biased, but I think our only way out of this mess is going to be science. And uh, we've got to look at the way we're teaching science to these people that are going to have to save the world that we've left them. There's a, a wonderful essay that was written by Alison Gopnik in the New York Review of Books. Um, she actually used baseball, but in honor of being in Canada, we're going to use hockey here. So imagine if we taught hockey the way we teach science. Well, if we taught hockey the way we teach science, then kids wouldn't actually get to play hockey. They'd, they'd be taught the rules of the game, uh, and as undergraduates, they might get to reproduce famous historic hockey plays. <laughs> but only in graduate school would they at last actually get to play a game. What kind of hockey players would they be? Well, that is, to a large extent, how we're teaching science. And we're often doing it um, you know, without giving them the hands-on experience. And as Malcolm Gladwell describes in Outliers, the story of success, practice isn't the thing you do once you're good, it's the thing you do that makes you good. And he gives uh, this rule called the 10,000-hour rule, where he describes how the people that become truly excellent at something have generally put in 10,000 hours of really hard work to achieve that excellence. And I think We've heard some of that excellence here and some of the musicians that, that we've been privileged to listen to. I'm guessing that they've exceeded that 10,000 hours by some considerable amount. And uh, this graph, for example, is of violinists, and it shows that the ones that become professional and become most excellent have put in 10,000 hours before they reach adulthood. Now, the way we're teaching science when we do teach it at all are things like this. This is a standard uh, observational lab where kids get to learn the power of observation by watching a candle burn. It's like watching paint dry. And I know a good teacher could make it relevant, but the thing is that kids have an energy, an emotional energy. They want to make a difference, and we need to tap into that. They want to change the world. We did when I was that age. And so they want to feel like they're doing something real. So my idea is that we have them do something real. We have them do real science that's actually going to help our own communities when we need it the most. And so uh, this gets back to my thinking globally, acting locally. So my local is the state of Florida, where the motto is, if you think our voting is bad, you should see our driving. But it's a beautiful place. I live on the East Coast, an amazing um, area, an estuary called the Indian River, River Lagoon. And it's uh, 156 miles long, and it's considered to be the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States. Phenomenal place. We have manatees come up to our dock. I see these great big pink birds called roseate spoonbills fly over my house in the morning. We have dolphins. It's, it's phenomenal. But like so many such places, it's under a lot of environmental stress these days. And one of the most alarming manifestations of that distress is that we're seeing dolphins, a resident population of dolphins, showing up with this flesh-eating fungal infection. It's a lobomycosis. Truly, truly alarming. And if you know anything about dolphins, you know they have exquisitely sensitive skin. These animals must be suffering horribly. And this is coming from pollution. 
So one of the thing, technologies that we've been working on at ORCA has been to try to develop ways to make pollution visible. And when you're talking about water pollution, really an awful lot of pollution resides in the sediment. And that's a quick way to be able to figure out um, the historic uh, pattern of pollution distribution. So taking a sediment sample is very simple, and you end up with something like this, and then the usual thing is you send it to a lab, and then what do you test for? There are literally thousands of potential pollutants in our environment these days, and if you think your government is protecting you from them, you're wrong. Now, what we've reasoned is what you need here is the equivalent of a canary in the coal mine. Coal miners used to take canaries down with them into the coal mines because they didn't have sensors that could detect the poisonous gases that they had to worry about. But the canary was so sensitive that they knew if the canary stopped singing or worse, keeled over, they needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. So the canary is what's known as a broad-spectrum bioassay. Broad-spectrum meaning it's sensitive to a whole lot of different toxins, bio-living assay test. So we came up with a broad-spectrum bioassay that we're using that is, harkens back to my research in bioluminescence, and we use bioluminescent bacteria. The cool thing about bioluminescent bacteria is that their light output is directly linked to their respiratory chain, basically their breathing. So any toxin that interferes with that interferes with their light output. So we can take that sediment sample, mix it with some of the bioluminescent bacteria, and see if the light stays on or if it goes out. Very quick, relatively inexpensive test to look at toxicity. And you go out, you take samples in different places, and we color code them. Red is toxic, blue is non-toxic, so we can, can treat, uh, construct these pollution gradient maps that are just like that map in your newspaper, that weather map that you go to, that you look at, and you, red is hot, blue is cold. You've got a synoptic view instantly of what's going on nationwide. We want to do the same thing for pollution, and my ultimate goal is actually to get a pollution layer onto Google Earth. Now, that bright red down there is actually part of the reason for those sick dolphins I spoke about, but I don't have time to talk about that right now. But our goal here is to create a curriculum. And thanks to a uh, local funding group called Impact 100, which is a fabulous example of uh, thinking globally and acting locally that other communities would be uh, wise to emulate, um, we've gotten funding to develop a uh, curriculum that we're putting into our local uh, Indian River Charter High School. And so the kids are actually going to be involved in developing um, these pollution maps. They're gonna, we're going to give them the background. They're going to um, go out, do the sampling. They're going to... Uh, analyze the data, produce the maps, and then create community education and outreach programs to be able to implement the things that they've discovered um, and actually take action in their community and show that they can actually bring about change. So the idea is to have kids creating pollution maps within their own community, and actually we're going to try to create uh, videos that we can uplink to the web so that uh, other communities will be able to emulate this as we go along. And the kids, when, will get hands-on experience doing real science, creative thinking, and solving problems, working in teams, and ultimately knowing that they can make a difference in, de in dealing with these tremendous environmental Im uh, impacts and challenges that they're going to be facing. Thank you very much. Well done.